Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for bringing everybody together for this uh, nice, bright, sunny day outside. It's a little, a little on the warm side, but we, we enjoy it, God, and we enjoy your creation. We ask that you would direct us in your word tonight and help us to concentrate clearly on it. And uh, Lord, give us clarity, too, on the overall timeline as we review a few things tonight. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you reviewed chapter 15 or not, but it's, um, it is pretty short. Yeah, so what I thought we'd do, you yeah, know, here we go. Is? Yes. What I thought we'd do is do a little bit of review, and I'm not going to quiz anybody or anything like that, but... <laughs> Just three to make years. yeah, three years. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. and just to make sure that we're all comfortable with where we're at, and, and because we're we're at the um, kickoff, we've been there, kind of hovering there, really since chapter eleven, since we had the seventh trumpet and we saw the temple, the sanctuary, and we saw the thunders, the lightnings, and we saw the angels gathered. And getting ready to pour out the bowls, and then we just kind of stop there, put that on pause, and so we've been parenthetically going through all these chapters that are laying out for us um, who all the players are, what they're doing, who's in what position where. So we've had several chapters of these parentheticals and how people are. Last weekend, weekend, yeah, it was last weekend. How everybody's going to end up. Um, not everybody, but, you know, some of the major players, like the 144,000, that's a big deal. And uh, some of the angels and their unique proclamations that they're making and so forth. So now we're getting ready to go. Chapter 15 is ramping us up and saying, okay, now, when last we met, like one of those TV things, um, this is our last episode where we left off. Well, that's kind of what the Lord is doing to John here, ramping up again, getting ready Okay, we're before the throne. You remember, this is where we were at before. We've got the thunders and lightnings, and we've got all this going on, and, and the angels are getting ready to go out with their balls. And um, kind of like the picture here. Um, they're not going to dump them all at once, I don't think, but um, rapid succession, and I think the lasting effects are going to go on, and it's going to be pretty horrific from this point on. So um, just to bring us all up to speed, and... Where we've been so far, I thought it'd be good to uh, kind of review. You remember this magic little chart, right? So in chapter chapter one, we had, and I will quiz you on this. In chapter one, we did have um, verse 19, which gives us the outline of the whole book. Does anybody have that? Do you remember what that was? It's in the Bible. Uh, that's right. right. The things which you can see, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The outline. Exactly. So it outlines the whole book. So um, write the things you've seen, which I like the notion that the, when John wrote the things he'd seen, is he wrote the Gospel of John. We don't really have a day for Gospel of John, but we know it's somewhere way up here in this time period. Jesus told him, write the things which you've seen, and we've got the Gospel of John. Um, the things that are in chapters 2 and 3, right? And then chapter 4 on is the things that are metatata after these things. And metatata after these things is specifically mentioned in chapter 4. So as we get in here, chapter 4 and 5 are before the throne. And... John is trying to take it all in, and he uh, sees that somebody there has got a scroll that can't be opened, and he's sad about that because he kind of knows what it is. It turns out the Lamb of God can do this, and, they begin, and the Lamb of God opens the scroll. As he opens the scroll, the title deed to heaven and earth, all of creation, um, then with these seals, these seven seals, 
each one um, brings more and more trouble on the earth. And then um, we get into chapter 7, and it's kind of a parenthetical chapter, right? And we, what, what kicks off in chapter 7, remember? I want you to flip through your Bibles as we do this. The tribes. The tribes still got 144,000. Okay. What else? Is that it? Is that all that happened to chapter 7 is 144,000? Tribulation saints. Tribulation saints. Yeah, see some martyrs and so forth. Yeah. And then uh, we get into chapter 8. What happens to chapter 8? Chapter 8 is kind of leaves the parenthetical and goes back onto the time scale, right? What happens in chapter 8? Trumpets. Trumpets. So then we've got that parenthetical happened in chapter 7, and then we've got um, the trumpets happening. And the trumpets, remember, they are on a gra much grander scale than the seal judgments. And there are a lot of similarities between them, not exactly, but they're a lot on a, on a grand scale. And then chapter 9. Chapter 9 is our, our first woe, right? And what all is going on in chapter 9? Remember the demonic activity that goes on? Bottomless pit. Yeah, bottomless pit. Chapter 10 was another parenthetical, though. What was in chapter 10? The little book and the angel, right? And the seven thunders. So then we've got another woe in there. And then we've got um, chapter 11 and 12. So chapter 11, we get into the two witnesses. We get the two witnesses killed and so forth. Chapter 12 goes into greater explanation on how um, Satan is in that battle, the war in heavens, and he and the demons are kicked down to the earth. It's interesting that it doesn't tell us that one third of the the one third of the angels, the ones that had fallen, were kicked to the earth. It doesn't really tell us what troubles they're up to and what shenanigans on the earth. Shenanigans is kind of a playful word, but what those demons are probably doing is not very playful at all. It's got to be horrific. It doesn't really give us any details, but I imagine they're doing their worst. And don't have to imagine too hard, right? So chapter 12, we saw the woman, and she represented what? Yep. And so... Um, the Antichrist now possessed by Satan goes after her and all the saints. And the Lord goes before them, leads them off into the mountains. And what were the, what was the general area that we know is safe according to the Old Testament? That's going to be kind of a safe zone where they're free. Petra, Petra area. What's modern day Petra, Jordan? Yeah, it's Basra, right? And Moab. In that kind of area, Edom. So that's kind of like for Moses and the Jews in those days, the land of Goshen. And so it's going to be the same kind of a thing. It's very cool. Or it's across the river. <laughs> yeah. No, that's Mount Carmel over there. You know, Mount Carmel right up the road. Goshen Valley. Yeah, it is. Goshen Valley. <laughs> they like to repeat those things, don't they? I don't know if. Some of the names are kind of kind of funny, but anyway. So, uh, Antichrist comes in, possessed by Satan, and goes into the temple, defiles the temple, right? And then also, we, we see in chapter 13, we have a new character introduced, and who's that in chapter 13? In addition to the Antichrist beast, we have... Another beast. Yeah, we have another beast. We have another beast. A.K.A. Who is that? A false prophet. And so some of the things we were looking at, again, is some of these countries and nations and the hills and so forth. And those can be uh, hotly debated, and they are hotly debated. But the main thing is we've 
as we discussed, is that uh, we find that the domain of the Antichrist is the whole earth. And we read several passages about the whole earth, and, and there's some debate about what the seven hills are, or where the seven hills are, and, and so forth. I like the idea, just because it's quaint and it's different, but it fits that whole thing of the seven hills being seven continents, you know, that there are hills that stick up out of the sea. It fits the whole earth thing. Where we get confusion is where, where we get down to um, the idea of where the headquarters is of the Antichrist himself. And, and we have the language we get from Revelation is we get Babylon, right? Now, here's a novel idea. It could be in Babylon. Okay. But it's hotly debated. I mean, you've got some people will make some great arguments. And there's a lot to it. You know, saying that Europe, looking at Europe and looking at the old Roman Empire. But then again, you look at the old Roman Empire and it goes all the way. It goes into the Middle East and into Turkey. And it goes north, north and south pretty far. And you're going down into the Egypt area, plus you're going into Europe. So it's kind of a broad area. Um, so also folks like Amir Sarfati will point out rightly that a lot of the Babylonian type of behavior and symbols and artwork, graphics, all this kind of stuff is coming up from the UN and the EU and a lot of European stuff going on over there that is paying homage to Babylon. Um, there's a place, you know, we'll, we'll get into it in a couple weeks here, but there's a place in the Bible where it talks about the great city and it's Babylon. There's another passage in here that talks about the great city and the great city is Jerusalem. So I thought, well, you know, I've never searched this out before. And what I always recommend that the folks do when um, studying the Bible and trying to search some, some things out is before pulling in the other Bible teachers and before pulling in commentaries and things, kind of search it out yourself a little bit. Look in your Bible, the concordance in your Bible, and go through those verses there. In the borders of your Bible, you'll have in your columns, you'll have chain references. Chase those down. If you have a keyword, like great city, great city. Let me check out great city. Use a, a Naves topical Bible, for instance, or a Bible dictionary. Look up great city. See what comes up. And chase it out a little bit on your own. Make some of your own notes. Then, after you do all that and you think you kind of see where it's headed, then it's legitimate to go, okay, now let me go see what some other Bible teachers, my favorite Bible teachers say. Let me go see what Thomas Nelson back in the day said in Spurgeon. Let me go see what uh, Dr. John MacArthur said. Let me go see what, well, let me go see what Jim McClarty says. Let me go see, but you know, and you've got John Walford, you've got a lot of teachers. Go check them out and see what they say. And a lot of them will have insights to bring to bear on, on these passages. So what I found when I was searching, I'll tell you what I found, and that's going to kind of ruin it for you searching it on your own because I'm telling you now what I found. But when I was searching that out because I wanted to know on my own and to find out if um, Jerusalem um, could be the Babylon it's speaking of, because I've got to consider and say, well, you know, perspectives change, shift here and there. Um, Jerusalem falls under some horrific judgment, and we find that mostly in the, in the Minor Prophets. You know, you'll see that in Joel and um, Micah. I was reading Micah, you know, from front to back because Micah talks about, you know, Jerusalem is getting ready to fall under, Israel's getting ready to fall under some horrific judgment, according to when you read Micah. And it looks like that judgment happens. You've got the the uh, remnant, one-third, leaving and going and hiding into the hills, now Petra area. you got them leaving, two-thirds stays behind, and there's judgment. And God is castigating them. He's condemning them because of their um, Babylonian type of pursuits, false idols, 
falling into um, their heart of trees, the um, you know pharmacological type of experimentation, which I don't know if it's profiteering on people who are sick, and so it's literal like pharmaceutical, or if it's drug abuse, or if it's both. I guess it would all be drug abuse, wouldn't it? When you're abusing other people with it and trying to make money off them. There's the little dealers that deal on the street corners, and there's the big dealers that deal in corporate offices, right? So uh, all these types of things that are going on, and he links them to uh, Babylon in so many different ways. And we're gonna, we'll get into that, for instance, in, in uh, Revelation 17, in places like that. But there's some things with Babylon that, where he's condemning Babylon and he's talking about some things that are going to happen to them and they're going to become a desert land. It's going to be a wasteland and it's going to be that way forever. So if you look at that and what he's saying about Babylon, and then you go and you look at Jerusalem, you say, no, nah, it's not going to be Jerusalem. Jerusalem's not going to be that way. It's going to be restored. And it's the promises of the Old Testament for the Jews is, um, is old Jerusalem is going to be opened up and it's going to become a blessing and it's going to become a blessing to all the nations of the earth and so forth. So we scratch that off the list. So that's an example of how you can kind of search some, some, some things out. Now, I'll give you a hint of one thing that I want to do. I was discussing with you briefly the other day, Alexis, about this. And that is when you get into uh, the next couple chapters of Revelation, it talks about Babylon and Babylon has fallen, and some of the things that have people are mourning and lamenting about Babylon, it mentions a lot of their uh, product, okay, that they're going to be missing out on. Um, you know, the uh, fine jewelry, fine stones of certain types that I'm not going to even mention right now. I want you to check it out and read it. Maybe make a list and find out what major countries or nations right now trade in those goods, right? Because we've got to be so close now that some of these nations are trading in these goods. And everybody's going to be mourning because they're gone. So uh, if you find a top two or three list in this, and one similar one comes across the board pretty consistently, you can say maybe, ooh, it might be, that might be the Babylon that's being spoken of. I think some of these things are kind of a mystery and we won't know exactly what they're going to look like because we don't have that yet. So what else we looked at is we looked at the, uh, the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We looked at Daniel's vision with the three animals and then the fourth beast, of course, too. We looked at these and then what Daniel was, or what John was shown is he was shown in reverse the same animals except what John was told is that let me back up. What Daniel is told is, here's one nation that's going to come up, and then here's what's going to happen to it, and then there's going to be another nation, and here's this animal. And then the next thing that's going to happen is there's this animal here, and he takes over here. John is shown looking back and says, you know how this animal over here was, you know, was really strong and, and mighty, and, and you know how this one over here was uh, you know, swift and so forth. And he goes, the Lord is showing all these things, and to John, and he's saying, okay, this kingdom that's coming right now, that's going to be run by the man of sin, it's all of these. So it's, it's a combined thing. It's like these in, in all their bad respects. It comes up quickly. It's very strong. It's going to cover the whole earth. You've got Babylon you've got, with Nimrod. Nimrod was a giant. He was also the world's first dictator. And all the civilized world at the time, he had taken over it and conquered it. So he's like that, too. Uh, Babylon is also the city of, of great wickedness and Baal worship. You had the Tower of Babel trying to reach heaven on their own and all this fleshly stuff. It's like that. So a lot of what John seeing is seeing the nature of, you know, all the worst the world has ever had to offer in the past, John? That's going to be crammed into this last three and a half years. And that's mostly what the Lord is showing them. But there's some mysteries there, like we've got the ten horns, and we don't know who they are. Now, people will... Pull up and say, well, you know, you got Rome, you got the ten horns, let's take a look at some of these nations who were there and they were gone, and we can get into this in Revelation 17, and one's dropped off, and another one came up and it rose up. And, okay, so we 
know kind of generally some of the nations that were here and what's gone and what's left and whatever. We don't know who the rulers are. What we do see is there's going to be a confederacy at some point where there's 10 rulers, 10 little horns, and there's going to be the Antichrist over all of them. So he's going to have them um, and, and the world divided somehow into 10 parts, you know, district 9, district 10. He's going to have it divided up, and these other rulers are going to be co-regents with the Antichrist ruling on the earth. And then you have the religious system and the uh, false prophet and how that comes up. Now, what the two horns are, some people will argue over what the two horns are. Now, the, the horns, the horns, um, a lot of time people will say that's power and authority, that kind of thing. But the horns usually are symbolic of leaders, right? So the two horns, the false prophet um, might be, you know, he might have a helper or some kind. Who knows what that looks like? The false prophet. Why do you have two horns there? Um, this is kind of confusing. and We can guess. We won't be around to find out when it happens. So some of these things are just things you've got to wait and see how they, how they come about and what it's going to look like. So we'll get into more of the, the dragon later on. We'll get into more of Babylon and so forth. But uh, so we're going to, we'll get there when we get there, but that's just kind of the overview. So now back to our story. Again, as I said before, here are the verses in Revelation chapter 11 where we left off with the real time timeline here. In Revelation 11, verse 15, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So they're rejoicing, they're celebrating, because here he goes. Guys, he's going to do it. He's going to take it all back. This is it. Verse 19, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of the covenant was seen within his temple, so let's get this straight here. There's a couple different temples, right? What we have on earth is a picture of what God has in heaven. It's not the real deal. So that's not all spirit realm and a type there. We, we live in a simulation down here. We are a construct down here that God created based, based on what he has up there in heaven. So this is what we have in heaven. We've got the temple. We've got... There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So this is kind of where we're at. Um, when they're in there in heaven, they're saying, uh, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, uh, verse 17, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. They, to them, that's beginning in folks in heaven, and that probably includes us. We look at it, he's beginning to reign now because his wrath, he's cleaning up the earth now. And part of that is destroying wickedness. So that's the beginning of reigning. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. This is God's creation. So this is what he's doing. He's destroying the destroyers. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant was seen. Um, so you know, we have all the peals of thunder and so forth. Temples in the Bible. Uh, real, top, real quick off the top of your head, can you think of uh, all the t temples that we read about in the Bible? So we got this one in heaven. So that's one. Solomon's. Solomon's. Herod's. Ezekiel's temple and who else? Herod. Herod's temples. What's that now? Well, the tabernacle, you could say the tabernacle, you know, is a type of temple. It's a temporary one. It's a traveling one, right? Well, it has an ark in it. It's got an ark in it. Yeah. And um, who else? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Interesting, when you read in 
um, the description of New Jerusalem. What do you find in New Jerusalem about the temple and New Jerusalem, about a temple in New Jerusalem, and when you get into the end of the book of Revelation? There was no temple in it. Isn't that fascinating? So an interesting thing, too, is, is to, to look at not just the temples and where all they're at. Is sometime do a study, look up throne or thrones, and try to find all the ones that are connected with God, and look at all the places there are thrones. It's, it's pretty much when you get to kingdom area, there are thrones all over the place. So a throne is wherever he decides to go and put the hassock down and kick his feet up, right? It's like, it's like Air Force One. Whatever one he's in That's is, it. is the throne. That's it. Kind of like that. So that uh, is where we left off. So then we get to chapter 15. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. So this is it. This is the last hurrah right here. I created this graphic because the only thing I could find online were kind of cheesy drawings and things. I'm sorry. Some of the artwork was creative, but anyway. Um, You're disappointed. Yeah, why don't you do it yourself? Yeah, I know. Why did I? Or why did I? I did. Um, that one I just did. I did that one myself. So. No, your artwork. Your drawing with chalks? No, that would be. That'd be a mess. I got okay. a poster board downstairs. <laughs> 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 Bring it back. Okay, chapter, in verse 2. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. This, we've kind of seen this imagery before, right? And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. Now, how did they conquer the beast? What was the way they conquered the beast? They refused it, didn't they? It all happened to their martyrdom. They said, they said no. And they followed the Lamb of God. Just say, Just say no. <laughs> Just say Jesus. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways. Now this has got to be particularly what they're focusing in on here is, is who. Who would be singing the song of Moses? Probably Jews, right? And that's, remember, tribulation is about the salvation of the Jewish nation. So it's about Israel. So this particular portion here is focusing on um, the Jews who are, who are coming out of this. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Now, there, there uh, is the notion by some respected teachers that the only people who are really saved out of the tribulation period are Jews because it's all about Israel. Um, or at least before, um, you know, wrath hits, that kind of thing. However that shapes out, we know that there are Gentiles who survive the tribulation and who become saved. There has to be because how do you have all the nations come into the holy mountain to worship him? How do you have Egypt mentioned in the kingdom and the Egyptians and the king's highway so they can travel from Egypt and go worship in Jerusalem? The Egyptian Jews. The, Egyptian <laughs> Jews. <laughs> the Jewish Gentiles. So you, we've got a lot of instances about the nations um, being spoken of in the, in the kingdom era. So um, to what the ratio is, I don't know. Remember that we had the end of chapter 9 and people refused to repent even after all the demons and things were released and Abaddon and all this kind of stuff. And they refused and then they picked up their worship. They ramped up their worship for the dragon, right? It's crazy. We, I don't know what the ratio of Gentiles to Jews conversion are because scripture doesn't tell us. We know some, some are. 
and they, they convert because we end up with them coming into the kingdom and then, um, you know, worshiping the Lord and they're being warned that if they don't show up in Jerusalem during the Lord's feast days along with Israel to worship and recognize these because the feast days are not about Israel. The feast days are not the feast feasts of Israel. They're not the feasts for the Jews. The feast days are all about Christ and they all point to Christ and they're all types of Christ, typology and so forth. So the feast days are about him. So if you want to ignore those, then you'll probably end up going through a drought or something. We read through this in the Old Testament too. Um, so all his, for all your, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Um, that's another one of those apocalypses, right? The revealing. So all of Christ's righteous acts have been revealed. There's some apocalyptic language for you. It's all been revealed, revealed. Verse six, and out of the sanctuary, we're still speaking of the temple in heaven, right? In verse 6, came the seven angels with the seven plagues. So remember, way back in Revelation 11, they were rounded up, they were ready to go. All these parentheticals. Now we pick up the narrative here. They're clothed in pure, bright linen, which the bright linen would be symbolic of their purity, right, and holiness, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. I can't imagine what that's like. White smoke glory his, you know. Um, and this is, this is staggering. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So God's alone in this sanctuary, in the temple in heaven, nobody's in there but God, because he's everywhere. So nobody can even go in there until this, this work is done. Um, I don't know that I can say the reason why this is. Um, any guesses? Because your guess is as good as mine. Too smoky. Too smoky. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was like when he entered the temple in the beginning, they, the priests couldn't do there. They couldn't enter the temple because he is he was manifest. His glory was manifest. So I'm assuming same same verbiage because his glory was manifest. No one. I, I normally would think that way, and I was kind of wondering about that. My life, mind ran in the same direction. Other than, other than everybody at this time, you know, angels and so forth, everybody's glorified bodies. But we're still not as glorious as he is. Yeah. Not as glorious as he is. I don't know. Is, is there a full throttle to his glory? Is there? A, if he wants to, I guess he can. That's as good a guess as any. I, I really don't know. At this point, his judgment is, he's, in his mercy, he's put off this judgment till now. So now this judgment, the I mean, if this is the crescendo of any judgments or anything going on. So I'm thinking this is the last of it. This is the end of it. He's showing... Himself. Yeah, maybe in maybe in some ways it's it's um, perhaps He's showing his glory in his in judgment. his justice. Yeah. yeah. So if you're in if he's in his temple and that's where he is, you're going to be kind of awestruck with him looking at him. So maybe he wants to focus off him right now, but more on what he's doing on earth, what the sun is doing on on earth. And uh, his glory is being manifested in his judgment and his wrath and taking. Because remember the songs and the praise is all about, look, he's taking over. This is it. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. And I know that we generally as people don't like to equate that his justice is just as glorious and wonderful as everything else, all the other ones. And so this is. Because God is love. Right. <laughs> and so I think that's a great way for it to be like in the beginning. He entered and was doing this, and he should kind of glory filled it, and they couldn't go in. Ah, oh, yay, God. And now at the end, it's the same. Okay, yay, God. And, you know, yes, just to that's have that be true. Because we do see echoes of what started off originally, you know, between um, Genesis and Exodus. We see echoes of that. Now we see the completion of all those things full circle in the book of Revelation. Thoughts and questions about where we're at so far 
in the judgment in the book of Revelation and so forth. Or about anything that we have discussed so far that maybe we didn't cover as thoroughly or you have comments or questions on? I have a, a squirrel question. A squirrel question? Yeah. You don't want to ask it now? But no, but I, I want to keep it in this. It's not about what you talked today. Okay. So, uh, Adam had dominion over all the animals in the creation and whatnot. Including and he squirrels. Said, well, including the squirrels. squirrels. Is that the squirrel question? <laughs> Three and a half years. Yeah. Um, so, he had dominion over everything. And it all went for our good. It was all made for our good as people because that was God's. Mm -hmm, that was know. his intention, okay. yeah. So then Adam sinned and got kicked out. He no longer had dominion. Now Satan has dominion. So, is that part of, like, how everything is going to. Because Satan is tweaking it all for his evil. Well, I mean, it could be. It could, it could be, and we, we see what we see some of this expressed in um, Revelation chapter six, right? How did some of the people die in Revelation six? Remember, it talked about all the, yes, <laughs> it talked about all the animals turning on people. Remember that Revelation chapter six. So that is part of the wrath of God. As all the cute little fuzzy animals turning on people. You know, some of the verbiage in this, in chapter 15 here, I think, is where the, the pre wrath folks kind of get confused because it talks about being the end of the wrath, you know, bowls were filled with wrath. Oh, well, that's where the wrath of God starts. Mm -hmm. Now, that started back in chapter 6. It really did. And, and, and some people even will try to stretch and go, well, it doesn't happen until the end of the seals because that's when they're saying, oh, behold the wrath of God. Well, right. the. The behold, the wrath of the Lamb is, is after the fact. They're not saying, hey, what's that coming over here, guys? Do you see that? What is that over there? By golly, I think that's wrath. <laughs> <laughs> it, that's not it. They're, they're commenting after the fact that uh, this is stuff that happened. This yeah, is the wrath of God. That's their commentary on what's already happened from the beginning of the seals being busted open. It's all wrath. Yeah. It looks again, but way before that. No. Well, it did, but. What do we know about wrath concerning, what did we learn? One thing interesting, we did see wrath a few times in the Old Testament. Fault was brought on some people, the judgment and so forth. Mm -hmm. Something weird happened in the New Testament, though, where Sodom and Gomorrah is a big one. Um, but then what we don't read in the New Testament, we don't read in the narrative of the Gospels, we don't read in Acts, is we don't really see any wrath at that time at all, do we? Well, and wrath is never brought on the unrighteous. The what? The, the righteous, well, not righteous, yeah. All <laughs> oh, the righteous, right. The righteous, yeah. Well, where is that? Yeah, where's that at? First Thessalonians 5? Yeah, but I mean, no. all throughout, there was never wrath on the righteous. I mean, Solomon and Gomorrah, he had yeah, to you didn't, out. He yeah, had, no, Solomon so, uh, and Gomorrah. He got Noah and his family up in the ark before. Okay, talk us through that narrative. I mean, that's that's the perfect example. When Jesus said it would be as in the days of Lot, and I don't think he's talking about necessarily just the sin and the homosexuality, which... You know, is is a big deal, and I think that has something brings to well, bear on my it. My question this morning, that was my comment this morning, was that judgment never comes because we've become so evil. Judgment becomes it. God's acts are never pre-qualified by what we're doing. God's judgment is always because He deemed it so. Yeah. So He doesn't act emotionally. It's not like, oh, they're so bad now; they need spanking. It's yeah. He always knew this was happening, and it was always His will, and He waits until the proper time, His time. Yeah. To reap the judgment. Well, Jesus also said he didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. And yeah. those who don't believe in yeah. Jesus are already judged. Yeah. Well, Jesus yeah. took our wrath for us on the cross, right? Yeah. Yes, he did. He bore our sins, didn't he? So any of those judgments, like it says, you know, and this was a big turning point for me, is any of these, whether it was Noah or whatever, it wasn't because we were so evil, as in the days of Lot or as in the days of Noah, it was because we were so evil all you know, we were good, and we just got worse and worse and worse, and now it's time. It's It was always time because he deemed it so. We've always been evil. We've never been good. Let's be real. <laughs> you know, it's pretty much never. There's none to do. Yeah. No, not one. <laughs> well, let's, let's review just by simply reading. You know, it's part of uh, First Thess Thessalonians 4. And <laughs> I, almost said, I almost did it like this again. Think when you joke around, you, when you joke around too much. Yeah. And then pretty soon it sticks and then you go back and you try to, huh? So that's going to become your voice and you keep talking like I that. know. <laughs> and that's what happens. You cross your eyes too long like that, they're going to stick. <laughs> Remember that? You joke around saying Thessalonians too much like a Red Skelton or something. And then next thing you know, 
Remember him too, like Cadoodle like Hopper or whatever? Uh, Larry. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bet you did. Well, uh, uh, turn to First Thessalonians, mm -hmm. chapter four. Let's let's look at um, starting at verse thirteen. And mine's in the New King James Version. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or dying. That's a euphemism for dying, right? Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, those who have died in Christ, right? Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain will, uh, until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep or have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, harpazo, that's rapture in the Latin. We shall be snatched away, we'll be caught up, together with them in the clouds. So notice it's not Jesus returning all the way, it's we meet him in the clouds. So this is rapture, it's not the second coming. To meet the Lord in the air, unless we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That'd be a weird thing to say if we're going through the tribulation, right? Um, he didn't tell us how to build a bob bag or anything or how to survive in the mountains with mountain <laughs> food and dehydrated stuff or anything. Well, that's us for other reasons. Uh, yeah. Now... <laughs> The people who are saving that stuff up, a lot of them might need it, like the Mormons. Mormons yeah. yeah, probably a good idea. They are stocking. So, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, they're saying peace and safety now, right? The UN, and they're having all these peace and unity and peace and safety meetings and so forth. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope. It's an assurity of salvation. Salvation here meaning, uh, you know, deliverance in particular, because he's already talking to people who've been saved. They're already born again, sealed in Christ, right? So he's talking about deliverance. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we're awake or asleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other, he says that again, just like he started off, and edify, build up one another, just, you, just as you also are doing. So that's such a, a powerful passage there about the wrath of God contrasted, contrasting the church, the bride of Christ, and what we see and endure compared to what all is going on in the book of Revelation. So, um, yeah, wrath of God, wrath of God, we don't we don't see pertaining to the to the bride of Christ at all. It's absent in modern history. Yes. Um, so there's different kinds of wrath. And so if we look at wrath like um, cataclysmic wrath, which is um, like flood, flood or like natural disaster type right. thing again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like consequential wrath um i mean obviously we can experience those things yeah um if you want to say that that the result of those things are wrath i think um i, I we saw those things in the old testament just because there's a, a big tornado going through a trailer park I don't think that's necessarily the Holy Spirit's wrath on the trailer park as a blight upon the earth, and it's his wrath taking it out. We live in a cursed world, and um, remember, remember the story in the Gospels about the tower that filled and 
fell and caught, killed a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And they're asking Jesus about that. What was Jesus' response? It can happen to any of you, but you get saved. Yeah, basically. He said, you know what? You need to repent. Be ready. You don't know when you're going to die. We live in a cursed world. Floods can happen. Fires can happen. Um, tornadoes can happen. Hurricanes. Asteroids falling from the sky can happen because we live in a, in a cursed creation right now. So Jesus' response is, oh, you need to repent. Get saved. Because that way if something happens, you know you're going to heaven. Um, people, too, who are, are pre-wrath, will, will, they sometimes will look at Revelation chapter 6 and they'll say, well, no, no, that's, that's Satan's wrath. Satan's wrath, yeah, no. <laughs> well, okay, even if it is Satan's wrath, it doesn't make a qualification in there. This is the wrath of the Lamb, but in, in 1 Thessalonians, it does not make a qualification. Since we're not appointed to wrath. Um, Satan wanted to pour wrath out on Job and wanted to sift Peter and probably other disciples like wheat. Was he allowed, allowed to? No, he was not. It's restricted by the restrainer. Well, I don't see how opening a seal and giving judgment poured out on the earth can be classified as Satan's right. No, I, I don't either. It's an angel opening that, a seal from God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, Satan's got no part of that. I know. He's a recipient. It's kind of, a, it's a it's a huge weakness in that system, you know, yeah. pre-wrath. Well, it's like, if you like pre-wrath so much, go with pre-trib. Pre-trib rapture. That's as pre-wrath as you get. Yeah. That's uber pre-wrath. Yeah. You know? They're basically just trying to find an excuse for mid Pre-pre-wrath. Yeah. pre pre <laughs> Well, so, any other squirrel questions? There's a back to the Harpazo. Yeah. It says we're going to be caught up in the clouds of Jesus. I wonder what that's going to look like from down here on there. <laughs> Unbelievers who are still there going, What's going on? I know. I wonder about that. And I, I, I wonder whether it's literal clouds or whether it's glory clouds, which I tend to think it is. Some shining glass that looks like, what, you know, when the sun hits it just right and it's moisture in the clouds, right, like it's just after a rain and the sun hits at the right angle. And sometimes it's like, it's glare. It's blinding. I think it's probably kind of like that. But the other thing I had thought on is we were talking about whether the there will be any Gentiles saved out of the tribulation. Paul talks about the, that's not going to start until the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. So I wonder if that, you know, I'm, I don't think that means that no, there won't be any Gentiles saved out of the trip, out of the trip but yeah. it's just like, okay, we're done with the Gentiles, and now it's time for the Jews again. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, exactly at which point, Exactly which point does that happen? You know, because we know that Jerusalem is trampled underfoot. When when John's told to go out and measure the temple and so forth, he says, don't measure the outer court because it's given to the heathen. It's given to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are still trampling Jerusalem underfoot when you get that far up. We know Jerusalem is being trampled underfoot. It's Armageddon. So... Um, but we know the promises of God, as in Romans chapter 11, really does, uh, is fulfilled in earnest at the second coming. And everything is, all the promised land, all the things that were promised come into fulfillment. We're, in the Old Testament, we're, where the Lord told uh, Israel, you will dwell, you will walk where your fathers walked forever. So think about that when you're thinking in contrast with Sometimes people will take a, a very literal read of um, 2 Peter 3, which is actually a quote from Isaiah, and say, oh, look, God's, you know, the heavens and earth are going to roll up like a scroll and consume fire and atomic boom, gone, kablooey kind of thing, and then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Well, how are they going to walk where their fathers walked forever and ever if everything's been kaboom, wrapped up, atomic destruction and everything, and then remade from whole cloth? See? So this, we'll, we'll get into that. That's some uh, some stuff I've researched and written about ad nauseum. But yeah, um, yes. I was going to say that kind of question. We're in the time of Gentiles and Jews are getting saved. We are. Yeah. So and we had Gentiles being saved in the Old Testament, right? Yeah. So I don't think to God it doesn't. I mean, it's his dispensation. 
But I don't think it matters. It's his, it's his focus. I mean... Yeah. You know, we, we enjoy we enjoy the benefits of, of all the things that with all the promises of Abraham, we get to share, partake in those. We haven't replaced the Jews. Would, would that mean that like during Gentiles got saved in that time period, they just wouldn't be a part of the 144,000 and they would still be saved? Or would they be going towards that number? Yeah, the 144,000 are specifically all Jews. All Jews. It's 12,000 from each of the tribes and he names the tribes of Israel. It's very specific. Those, those, Jews. Yeah, those 144,000 are designated for a specific purpose. They're going to be basically like evan evangelists. They're going to be like the Salvation Army. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on steroids. What the Salvation Army should be. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good question, so Because you've got also... Um, in Revelation chapter 9, where it says, none of those people repented. Well, clearly it's speaking about mostly, for the most part, just the Gentiles. It's just the nations. Because, and maybe they, up to that point, or after that point, maybe no, no more were being saved. Because you still had the middle of the tribulation, when you have this big revival and repentance of Israel, still waiting in the wings to happen. And leaving, and going and hiding in Petra area, or wherever, Jordan, Basra, Moab, Edom area. So you had the Jews later, so maybe that, at the <laughs> end of chapter 9 of Revelation, maybe I was speaking, maybe that's the end of um, salvation for the Gentiles, because it says nobody repented anymore. And they worship the dragon all the more. Some things to play with, to look at. It's kind of difficult because um, in uh, the Jewish culture, um, exaggerative language is the way they wrote very frequently. And John, all the apostles, you know, they, they were, for the most part, Jews, right? And um, so they wrote in those kinds of language, so they used exaggerative language to illustrate, to make a point, you know. If you did that one more time, I'm going to, you know, knock your teeth out. No. I've told you once, I've told you a million times. Not exactly. No. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of exaggeration. Going. So this, their language is full of that. So they and their culture would understand where they go, what those were and where they are. We, 2,000 years ago in the West, don't necessarily understand that. So. Okay, so we can close and um, maybe chase some more squirrels. And then we'll come back next time in the bowls and um, <laughs> in the bowl in the bowls it's going to be you know it's it's going to be pretty ugly but there's some things to talk about some other scriptures to bring to bear on the bowl judgments and, and what that's going to do because for instance let me ask you a question how do they survive um, when all the seas are turned to blood and all the rivers and streams immediately after that are turned to blood. Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> no, actually, Holy actually, there's, you, you find some texts in the scripture that say they're, they're kind of picking up and trying to drink whatever they can find that's not corrupted and it's mm -hmm. not water. Yeah. Can you imagine you go to the store and you want to go to, to Sam's Club and get the Sam's Club water or whatever like that? It's a bottle of water. You go, it's blood, mm -hmm. you know. Or even if it's not, there is a bottle of water, how long is that going to last? You open it up and Oh, <laughs> it's like those jars in, in the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, remember, and, and Pharaoh's uh, magicians, you know, saying these magic words, whatever, incantations over the vases, and they go to pour it into the Red Sea, next thing no blood's coming out of their vase. That's, you know, so we never yeah, don't know what the Lord's going to do. I don't know if it's gross, but how many of the corrupting evil people will just drink it? Yeah. They might try it. A lot of them are already drinking blood, right? Yeah, drinking infant blood. Yeah. You're not going to live very long that way. I'm just saying. Yeah. They'll try it, and after a while, they'll be looking for something else. So. Well, everybody will be so desperate to try anything. They'll be out at the stores fighting over orange I mean, juice, fighting all the juices, all the wine, yeah, all the hard liquor. Left, and then when that's all gone, you can't live more than, what, three days without mm -hmm. wine. Yeah, so it's going to be... And then they'll start dying. It's the judgment of God, y'all. That's what's happening. Yeah, we got to live more.
Bill died right. fighting over the last case of water. Yeah, yep. you'll never thirst again, see? Yes. You have the right water. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So if you're in Basra and you're in uh, Petra out there, that area, you probably have water. Okay, now we really are going to close in prayer and wrap this up, okay? Lord, thanks again for this night of review, and thank you for this group here who ask great questions and are sharp and staying on top of where we are tracking with all this stuff. And um, Lord, we ask for uh, continued insights into your word and more scriptures to bring to bear on what's going on. Help us to be honest and to approach your scripture with integrity and not try to read into it too much of what's not there. We can speculate, but help us to know where those lines of speculation are and where to draw those hard lines between what you've actually told us and, and what you haven't. And, and the guesses, well, we just get excited when we're talking, we get animated, and we're going to try to, we want to try to figure out exactly what you're going to do. And we get excited like the, the praises in heaven, God, about this is it, folks. He's, he, the Lamb has taken back over all creation. and He's going to establish his kingdom forever. And we're excited about that, Lord. So even so, come quickly, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.